Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, did anybody sneak a piece of candy that you didn't give to a kid? Anybody? Okay, there's one honest. Oh, there's a few. Okay, all right, good for you guys. Uh, Pastor Randy, was that your hand I saw? Okay, tw- two you got. Okay, good, good. Glad to see. Um, guys, what a great opportunity last night. Just so you know, what we prayed about right here and what we talked about was the fact that God sees us inside of our costume. The fact that we put on this good-looking us when we come to church, even though inside we might be hurting, even though inside things might be difficult, even though inside we carry sin, God sees through the costume. He sees exactly who we are. And He loves us nonetheless. Nonetheless. We also prayed for those people who don't know Christ, who came here last night and and might be drawn back by the loving hand that they saw. The hands and feet of Christ. The ones that you put out for them. So I want to thank personally everyone who helped serve over 600 people last night. Um, You did a wonderful job. The fellowship committee doing the coordination. Pastor Justin putting everything together. Everyone who participated with props and uh, trunk, uh, you know, trunks that were set up, and those of us that dressed in costume. Uh, it was really fabulous. So let's, oh, wait a second, you know, I left my little clicker down here. Um, so let's talk about this. Last week, we were in Habakkuk. Do you remember Habakkuk? Okay, and what was the key portion of Habakkuk? The fact that Habakkuk asked questions of God and these are some of the questions that he asked and like Habakkuk did we can true choose to trust God because of who he is and his love for us or not especially when things are difficult we have to trust him I got to tell you something we were without power here this morning Debbie Carrico called me on my ride into church and my son was in the truck with me I had her on a bluetooth And I was excited that we had no power. Okay, I really was. Because it's kind of like that first snowstorm, you know, when when everything's exciting because you you got to scramble around and figure out what to do, but it's not normal. And truth be told, I was a little disappointed when we got the lights back. I was. And and I'll tell you why. Because we were going to have service in the Heritage Chapel with no lights because the light was streaming through the stained glass windows. And everything would have been a cappella. And yes, I would have had to yell a whole lot. But it would have been okay. And I'd have thrown my notes away and I because I couldn't print my notes this morning because we had no power to do so. And we'd have no visuals and it would just be us worshiping God. And then the power came back on. Right? And I knew we'd have to answer questions like, well, why didn't you just move it back here? You know, it's uncomfortable over there. We want to be here. And I'll tell you what, it's, it's uncomfortable in here. Isn't it kind of stuffy in here? It's kind of hot. And that's, Stuart tells me the air conditioning is on, but it takes a while to get going. So I'm sorry for the stuffiness. He's, uh, he's just double checking for us. I might end up ditching my jacket here in a few minutes. So what we know from last week is that God says, trust us, trust us. There's a reason we're back in here. Okay, I don't know why. Maybe it was the fact that he wanted to strip us down from all of the things that we hold really important and say, look, that's not important stuff. What's really important is that we're together and that you're worshiping me. And maybe he just wanted to give us a reminder but not have us have to go through it all. I don't know. I don't know. Remember, his ways are not our ways, to borrow from Isaiah. We talked about that last week. Even if... He told us what he was up to and what his plan was. What did Habakkuk tell us? We wouldn't believe him anyway. Because it seems too far-fetched. It really does. Now this week, we conclude our three-week series in the Old Testament with a small but powerful portion of Ezekiel. There you go. Stuart, it feels like it just kicked on. That's good. Awesome. Uh, Would you all please uh, crack your Bibles open right now? Would you please turn to Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 1, we're going to start in. If you don't have a Bible with you, please get one. There's some stuff in here I really want to point out to you. 
Uh, And by the way, if you're visiting with us while you're reaching for a Bible, um, grab one of those blue cards and get it in the hands of somebody here uh, so we can get a um, a thank you gift in your hands for coming to visit us today. All right, Ezekiel. Hey, by the way, anybody who's ever been to my house or has seen me eat a sandwich knows that there's actually a recipe for bread in Ezekiel. I eat Ezekiel bread all the time. Um, there is Ezekiel 4.9. There's a recipe for bread in there, and it's still made today. And for those of you that have sugar problems, diabetics, it has incredibly low glycemic index. So it is fantastic for people that can't eat bread because of diabetes. Go check that out, Ezekiel. Okay, it's made. It's in, uh, they got it at Kroger. All right, little known fact. So the fruit, what's that? It's in the freezer section, my wife tells me. Yes, in the freezer section. All right, make sure you keep it in the refrigerator because there's no preservatives in it. The first thing we've got to do is establish who Ezekiel is, besides a guy who has a recipe for bread in his book. In a word, Ezekiel's a pastor. He's a pastor. Now, we're going to define what that is in a moment or two, but let's talk about last week with Habakkuk. He shared visions of the Babylonians coming to Judah to conquer them. Remember, the Babylonians came across the desert, up over the top, and they came down. The Assyrians had come down and taken out Israel, the top half of the divided kingdom. And then the Babylonians came behind them and took out the Assyrians. And Habakkuk said, hey, heads up, guys, because they're coming to get you, Judah, the bottom half of Israel in the divided kingdom called Judah. You guys are next. Why? Because you have not followed your Lord God. Now, I want to remind you, when the Babylonians came calling, they didn't just conquer you. They took the best of the best of your people back to Babylon. So if they conquered you here, they said, "Mm, let me see, okay, we'll take those guys. Oh, hey, we're going to conquer them. Let's grab some of their best people. And they built themselves this fantastic empire because they took the best of the best of the best people and put them to work high level educated talented people now ezekiel was part of that group that was taken about ten thousand people were taken back in 597 bc after they were uh, conquered they were in the second group of people that were taken back to babylon so ezekiel is in this group he doesn't even get his call to prophecy and to pastor and to teach until he's already there in Babylon for a few years. And he ends his ministry before they move back to Judah. He's the only prophet who did all of his prophesying, all of his work outside of Israel. All of it done in captivity. Now what he was called to was do the form uh, and, and, and the function of a priest at the time of pastor except he didn't have a temple he didn't have elements he didn't have any of the things that he could do except for teach that's the one thing that he could do that priests or pastors did then he could teach and teach he did now he taught and he taught and he taught and here's the crazy part There is not one record of his preaching having any impact at all during his ministry. None of it comes to fruition until later, when Ezra turns back and says, hey, remember that stuff Ezekiel taught? Let's start following it now. Ezekiel received actual messages from God, oracles it's called. And he got them from God verbally and disseminated them to the other Hebrews that were in captivity. Pastor Randy talked this morning about God speaking to Moses. Well, Ezekiel was simply the mouthpiece. God spoke to Ezekiel and spoke to his people through Ezekiel, verbally. As a matter of fact, we're going to read some of that this morning. His obedience was amazing think about this if you were a pastor i know nobody's signing up for the job today 
But if you were a pastor and you preached and you taught and you did everything you could to bring your people to repentance and not one showed any move toward God, how obedient would you be? How discouraged would you be? Ezekiel kept at it. Ezekiel kept at it. He's a guy I can't wait to meet in glory. Now, let's be clear. We are looking at one little slice of Ezekiel's ministry. Tiny little slice. Chapters 36 and 37. And are we looking at them because they're the sexiest chapters in the world? Are we looking at them because they're the most action-packed? Because No, no. We're looking at them because they show two very specific sides, almost like the uh, continental divide, where one side comes up and then the other side comes down. And what we're going to see is that juxtaposition here in in, uh, chapter 36 and 37. Now, these chapters were not, I repeat, not written to us, but listen to this. They were written to a sinful nation by a God that wanted to wake them up and give them hope for a future with him if they came to repentance. Let me say that again and listen carefully. This was written to a sinful nation by a God that wanted to wake them up and give them hope of a future with him if they came to repentance. Hmm. It wasn't written to us But isn't it about us? Isn't it our journey too? Sounds like something we might have been through ourselves. We might be considering. Remember, we learn by observing the lessons of others. So we've got to ask some questions when we approach Ezekiel. Are we sinful? (laughs) Okay, I am. Have we or are we acting in a sinful manner? Are we willing to repent? It's not just can we, are we willing to? It's an act of the will. Can we see God's provision for us in our obedience? If I obey, will God protect me? And what happens if we, and in capital letters, actually decide to follow God for real? Not just on Sunday morning. Not just when it's convenient for us. Not just the parts of God's message we like. But everything he tells us. The difficult parts too. Now let's answer those questions by beginning to look at Ezekiel. So I said, chapter 36, verse 1. And you, by the way, I'm reading in the New American Standard Bible. You might have an ESV, an NIV. It matters not. Follow along if you like. And you, son of man, he's talking to Ezekiel here, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. It means that God speaks. God is active. He's volitional. He does things in his people's lives. Thus says the Lord God, and I quote, because the enemy has spoken against you, aha, and the everlasting heights have become our possession And then you see this word at the beginning of chapter, uh, verse 3, it says, therefore. I just want you to note, look at verse 4. What's the first word there? Say it loud. And how about the first first word in verse 5? And verse 6? And verse 7? Okay, so God is saying, hey, look. (whistles) Because the enemy has spoken against you, aha, and the everlasting heights have become our possession, because things have gotten so bad, because I've had to act in this way, here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. Verses 1 through 7 pretty much talk about that. What happens in verses 8 and 9 then? But you, O mountains of Israel, you will put forth your branches and bear your fruit for my people Israel, for they will soon come. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you shall be cultivated and sown. So God's saying here in the first seven verses, hey, you know what? There are enemies that have come up against you, and here are all the bad things that have happened. But don't lose heart, for 
I am for you. Have you heard that song on the radio? But I am for you. I'm not against you. Yeah, I'm not joining the praise band. Don't worry about that. But it's the idea that God is fully for us and not against us. Even when bad things happen, God is for us. What a wonderful thing. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn to you, and you shall be cultivated and sown. If that's the only thing God said to me in all of Ezekiel, I'd be turning backflips. See, this is about the kingdom age. Israel's going to return to being fruitful from the desolation that now plagues it. The kingdom age. Okay, the kingdom age. What is the kingdom age? Well, we know once Christ comes and the apostles are there, it's called the apostolic age. Once the apostles die, it is called the church age, and that's what we're in right now. Anybody tell me when the kingdom age begins? Say it nice and loud. You got it. When Jesus returns. That's the kingdom age. That's what God's talking about here. Hey, I'm for you. Verse 10 says, I'll multiply men on you, all the house of Israel, all of it, and the cities will be inhabited and the waste places will be rebuilt. From verses 10 to 15, God talks about the fruitfulness of Israel. And then something really bad happens in verse 16. In verse 16. God says, in a nutshell, what are you doing, Israel? You're making yourselves look just like everyone else in the world. Verse 16, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel was living in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their way before me was like the uncleanness of a woman in her impurity. Therefore, because of that, I poured out my wrath on them for the blood which they had shed on the land because they had also defied it with their idols. The people of Israel, God's chosen people, His people, looked like all the pagans that were worshiping idols. Brothers and sisters, what can we learn from that right this very second? We are God's chosen here, now. We're the church. We are sanctified, set aside for His glory. We are. Do we look like the rest of the world? What did we talk about last week in idols? Idols don't have to look like that little carved tiki top. Idols are things like security, money, jobs, children. None of those are bad things, but when we put them above God, they become idols in our life. When we don't worship the Lord God, Those are idols. And here, God is accusing Israel, actually condemning Israel for what they've done because they look like everyone else and they're supposed to look different. Do we, as a church, look different? I'll tell you what. Last night, for all those people that came here, those 600 people, you're darn tootin' we look different. We absolutely look different because we love them for no reason. There's nothing for us to gain but to love them. That's what God calls us to do. He calls us to be different. We are the light in the darkness. The church, those three ages, the apostolic age, the church age, we represent Jesus Christ. We do. God took his only son, sent him here in that apostolic age, and now he says, guess what? That's passed on to you. You Grab that light like this and you walk like the Statue of Liberty around like this and you let the light of Christ shine through you to them. It's exactly what God's saying here through Ezekiel. Hey, in Italian, what are you doing? Stop doing that. Don't look like the rest of the world. Look like me. Look like me. And then in verses 22 and 23, I've got to read these to you because you've got to hear this. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it's not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, 
but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. What's God saying? Look, I'm not going to give you a rose garden just so you'll feel all good and tickly. I'm going to do what I have to do to restore honor to the name of God because I am. And I will be honored. Now what's really interesting here in chapter 36 is a picture for you. For you and I, really. And I'm going to come back to it in a little while. And it's here in chapter 36, but I'm going to leave it as a a little bit of a hidden thing for us for just a few minutes. So what do we hear in chapter 36? We hear a rebuke. We hear a rebuke. God is rebuking us for what we're doing. If we're Israel. okay, We're not, but we can learn from this. Does God rebuke us for our sin? Yeah, He does. For our apostasy, for our idolatry, yes, He does. But then He gives this wonderful picture. He wants to let Ezekiel know what it's going to look like for Israel in that kingdom age all the way over here remember apostolic age church age kingdom age so he gives ezekiel in verse 26 actually i'll I'll start in verse 24 for i will take you from the nations gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land you israel have been spread apart all over the place i'm going to bring you back to the land Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. What a picture that is. What picture do we get there? A precursor to baptism, maybe? Salvation, and then a celebration of it with baptism? I will cleanse you. Here's the beautiful one. Verse 26, moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I'll give you something soft and malleable rather than this hard, unfeeling thing toward me. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. How many of us, when we came to Christ, immediately had a different feeling about things? Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah, I did too. B, okay. Thank you. Yeah, we had a different feeling, right? Immediately. Wow, something's different. Something's changed. What rebuke and promise do we have as a New Testament Christian? As dead as we were, We're now alive. We have hope in the Lord Jesus. To understand that statement, we've got to look at where everything began. Flip all the way to the very, very beginning of your Bibles. I want you to go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2. Genesis chapter 2. I just want you to see it in context, but if you don't have a Bible, you can look up here. Genesis 2, verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. All right, question for you. Is that at all unclear? If we eat from the tree, what will happen to us? 
Oh, we will surely die. Not we'll probably die, we might, we will what? Surely die. God tells us Himself, this is what's going to happen. Uh, did we eat? Everybody say yes. Yeah, yeah, we ate. Of course we ate. Genesis 3, if you're following. Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the tree, trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Who notices a difference in what she said and what God said? She added something? She didn't add something, she took something away. Okay. She changed the message. Substantively, she changed the message by saying, well, yeah, we'll die. Not surely, but we'll die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely shall not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. From that point, she ate. My question to you, were we alive or dead at that point? Say it loud, please. Dead. We were dead. The moment she chose to eat, we surely died. You say, well, I didn't eat. Yeah, you did. Take a tree. Take a tree. Is a tree the root that's in the ground way, way, way down here and the cell that's in that? And is a tree also the leaf that is right out here that sees the sun all the time? Are those both the tree? Yes. So guess what? You weren't alive at that time, but you were in the root of Adam. He sinned, you died. He died, you died. You can't separate yourself in that. Okay? You sinned in Adam just like I did. Now you say, well, yeah, but I still didn't make that choice. Okay, wait a second. Brothers and sisters, Adam was the perfect man. Eve was the perfect woman, and look what they chose. How many people want to stand up here and say, well, I'm perfect, number one, and I would have chosen differently? Because if you're going to come up and do that, let me back up a few steps so I don't get scorched with the lightning. Okay? It ain't going to happen. Right? We died in Adam. And we were spiritually dead at that point. As a matter of fact, it says we had a heart of stone. We had a heart of stone. Can you imagine that? Hard hearted. And had nothing changed in history, nothing whatsoever, we would have been born, separated from God, lived, and died forever. Don't believe me? Turn to Ephesians 2. Turn to Ephesians 2. God eats popcorn. Ephesians. After Galatians, before Philippians. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in verse 1, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Why? Because you followed Satan in the Garden of Eden. You followed Satan all the days of your life up until the point that something amazing happened. Right? And, and, and Paul's not a haughty guy. In Ephesians 2, verse 3, he says, Listen, among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. And then those two beautiful words, but God. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, so that we would walk 
in them. We were dead. In Genesis, we died. We were made alive in Christ. How does Ezekiel fit into this? Where does Ezekiel come in? Go back to Ezekiel. Go back to Ezekiel. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. Okay, go to Ezekiel. We just finished chapter 36, the part that we're going to study. And what happens then in verse 37 is God gives Ezekiel a picture. God has said to Ezekiel, hey man, guess what? The people have done so wrong here. That without me, they're done for. They're convicted. There's there's nothing good going on. Now I've told you that I'm going to restore you, but not now. But what does that restoration look like? I want to read this, and I'm going to try to read this. Oh man, I'm already starting. I'm going to try to read this without crying. But it's really hard for me. It's really hard for me. Ezekiel 37, as we read this, I want you to picture this for yourself. Picture this for the people that you have introduced Jesus Christ to, or them to Jesus. Think about the people in your family. Verse 37, uh, chapter 37, verse 1, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. So here Ezekiel goes out to the valley. It's full of bones. What do bones indicate to you? Death. He caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. They had been dead a long time. And there were lots of them. He said to me, Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. The Lord speaks. Hear the word of the Lord. Does God speak to us every day of our lives? Yes, the question is, can you still hear the small whisper of God? Have you been able to clear away enough junk that you can hear? Thus says the Lord God to these bones, uh, verse 5, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. Breath. We breathe. We speak. What do we know that God did in the Garden of Eden? He put his, he took this dust, he formed it into a man, and what did he do? He put his ruach, his breath of life. That's the Hebrew word, his ruach. His breath of life he breathed into man and made us alive. And it says right here, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin and put breath in you that you may come alive. And you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked and behold, Sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Can we see people that are moving around, that are walking in death? Can we see that today? Heck yeah. We see it all over the place, guys. Then he said to me, Verse 9, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may come to life. What do you think breath represents right there? Say it loud, you got it, brother. 
the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes from everywhere. North, south, east, and west, boom, here comes the Holy Spirit. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. And they came to life, and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And then you will know that I am the Lord When I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you will come to life, and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. What picture does that evoke for you? Look, we're not who Ezekiel's speaking to right here. He's speaking to the house of Israel. He's speaking to Judah. He's speaking to the Jews. What do we learn from this? Can you not see yourself knitted back together from a dry heap of bones because the Spirit of God came to you? And what about those people who don't know Jesus Christ? Why do you think we do this outreach on Wednesday nights? So that God can put them back together. So He can put life in them. Verses 15 through 23 talk about the reuniting of all of Israel. All of Israel, scattered as it was. These are God's chosen people. They'll be reunited in the kingdom age. Verse 21 says, Say to them, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations where they've gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. Jump down to verse 24. My servant David will be king over them, and they will... All have one shepherd, and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. Who do you think he's talking about right there? Jesus Christ. My servant David. Because he goes on to say that it will be the Messiah. Look at the next verse. They shall live on the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived, and they will live on it, and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. Who is the prince of peace? Who is from the house of David? It's Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them, and I'll place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Brothers and sisters, you might read this and say, well, that's great for Israel, but what about us? Well, this is a great picture for us, And you don't need to turn there if you don't want, but I'm going to turn to Romans 11. I'm just going to read a couple things for you. This is Paul speaking now, and he says, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Israel has rejected Christ so that the Gentiles can now be grafted in. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failures is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will will their fulfillment be? But I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. So Paul's talking about the Gentiles. Hey guys, you're in! And if that makes the Jews really jealous, I don't care because I want to use whatever I have to to bring them into the knowledge of Christ. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Huh, life from the dead. Where did we just read about that? Oh yeah, Ezekiel 37, like God said. If the first 
piece of dough is holy, the lump is also, and if the root is holy, the branches are too. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them, and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant. Ha, we got it, and you don't, Jews. Ha, ha, on you. Don't be arrogant towards the branches, but if you're arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. Had Israel not rejected, had Israel not been God's chosen people, had we not been grafted in to what they already occupied, we would have nowhere to go. You will say then, Branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. The Jews, broken off for their own belief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, He will not spare you either. Oof. Hey look, we're still all under judgment unless we have the cloak of Christ. Behold then, the kindness and severity of God to those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness. If you continue in His kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Last verse. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree. In other words, the Jews are God's chosen people and they are blessed. We need to be thankful that we have been grafted in. Now this looks like kind of a funky thing that I put together, but on the top is the New Testament. See, we're in Romans just there. And Romans points back to Genesis and says, hey, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, right? We saw that in Ephesians as well. And then you can see the revelation where at the end, everybody will be grafted in, everybody will be saved, the Jews and those of us that have come to know Christ. Well, look in the Old Testament. We started in Ezekiel. We looked back to Genesis. And what does God do in Ezekiel 37? He shows them what revelation is going to be. He shows them what that kingdom age will be. We can look down into the Old Testament in Ezekiel and know exactly what's going to happen to us and get a really good picture of it. I'm going to tell you a story, and it's, it's not exactly a story. It actually comes from um, a, uh, a psychological study. I want to share it with you, so bear with me for a moment. It's, it's just a few paragraphs. It says three elements. By the way, how many married people do I have? Either been married, married now, want to be married. Honey, you're supposed to put your hand up. Okay, all right. No, I'm kidding. <clears throat> That's a whole nother discussion. Okay, so three elements of a personality are involved in making a decision to become a Christian or in making any significant decision for that matter. They are the emotions, the intellect, and the will. Emotions, intellect, and will. Now, listen carefully because you went through this process. At some point, you did. For example, a young man meets a young woman. Hey there. Hi, how are you? That's normally when they turned around for me and ran the other way. Okay, but they're immediately attracted to one another. Both sides attracted to one another. They both say to themselves, now there's somebody I'd like to marry. At that point, if the emotions had their way, there would be a wedding. Like right that day in, at the picnic that you're at or in the bar you're in or the wherever. I don't care. A roller skating rink. You know, whatever it is. The Pitney Bowes office. Wh wherever. But the intellect intervenes. So emotions, then intellect. The intellect intervenes, intervenes questioning the impulsive emotional response. Questions like this come up from the intellect. Would we be compatible? What's she really like? Can I afford to support her? Both conclude it would be better to take some more time and answer a few questions before they proceed. So the two begin spending more time with each other. He eventually concludes 
that she's as beautiful on the inside as she is on the outside. She concludes that he's not as big of a horse's rear as he makes himself in front of his friends. Okay, That he really has this nice loving heart. Now, his intellect has sided with the emotions on the idea of marriage, and so is hers. But the final and heaviest vote remains to be cast. That of the will. Emotions, intellect, will. It stops the march toward the altar with these questions. Am I willing to give up this lifestyle for another? What about my freedom? Is it worth the trade? Am I willing to assume the added responsibility? The marriage will occur only when the will finally agrees with the emotions and the intellect. And so it is in coming to Christ. Think about your own walk. Man, this Christ thing is great. What, I have to pray a prayer? Okay, like, I get all these benefits? Like fire insurance and all that? Stuff. Okay, yeah. Oh, wait a second. If I do that, and I can't do this, and then, oh, oh, I can't do that. Mm, definitely can't do that one. I might go to jail for that one. Okay, no. Hmm. Hmm. I want to let you in on something. If you've known Christ for two weeks or uh, 25 years or more, you still have to go through that decision every time you decide to sin or not sin. Every time you decide how much closer a step you want to take to God or how much further away you want to move from Him. It's a daily decision. Do I click on that button on the internet? Do I give that really hot guy that second look? What do I do? That's something we're faced with every day of our lives. They weren't just faced with it in Ezekiel. We're not just faced with it in Romans. We're faced with it in Faxton Baptist Church every day. 